Episode 30 of Royally Rumbled is here. I'm Jordan. I am Robert. How are you, Jordan? Uh, I'm great. How's it going? I'm good. Doing very good. We're here to talk about... What is that? NXT TakeOver Toronto 2019. Sick. Yeah, took place at the Scotiabank Arena in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And uh, we decided to do a review episode for NXT instead of a prediction episode. Because NXT is, like, really awesome. And it's going to be fun to discuss match results and things like that, rather than just their buildup. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm excited to uh, do this with this takeover and see how it goes. So, uh, overall, what would you think of the show, Robert? I very much enjoyed NXT TakeOver Toronto 2. Um, I thought it had some really, really good quality stuff on it. Um, And I didn't think that SummerSlam would be able to compete with it. I think maybe SummerSlam passed it a little. Hmm. I enjoyed SummerSlam a lot. Hot but take. That's not to say, yeah, that's not to say Takeover wasn't good. I just I think I enjoyed SummerSlam a bit more. Hmm. Uh, and honestly, I've kind of got to agree with you because uh, SummerSlam was awesome. I was fully, fully surprised by the sheer amount of enjoyment that I got from SummerSlam. But NXT usually firing on all cylinders, and it did not disappoint. Definitely not. So let's talk about, uh, let's go in match order here. The Street Profits versus the Undisputed Era for the NXT Tag Team Championships. I was really happy that this led off the show. Um, It's a way to get uh, packed with energy to carry the show forward. Um, I don't know that there's another match that I would have led off with other than maybe uh, the triple threat. So this was, I thought, a really good pull for the first uh, match. Definitely. they uh, Just hearing the Street Profits entrance music kick off the show really set the tone for the rest of the night. That and they like jumped up into the crowd and they were running around and I thought it was a lot of fun to, to start it off. They got everybody in a good mood for it. Yeah, and it was actually like a very good showing for the tag team champions. We've been seeing them pop up on Raw and SmackDown, and they really brought everything they had to show here. They won the titles in a ladder match, you know, uh, and now they're hanging with the Undisputed Era, probably the best tag team in all of NXT. Yeah, and I mean, there were so, like, there's so many times during this match where I was just like, they're kind of doing everything. It was a very much an old school tag team match where uh, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish were separating Ford and Dawkins from their corner and doing quick tags and just beating them down, beating them down, beating them down. Um, but I mean, the the spots started to get crazy towards the end. Yeah, specifically the spot where Kyle O'Reilly had Montez Ford in the heel hook submission Mm. or that Achilles Mm -hmm. lock. And uh, he's like about to tap, about to tap. And then in comes Bobby fish only to get dumped by Angelo Dawkins. And that spot pops me every time. And I feel like they do that in every undisputed era tag team match. Yeah. But like it gets me every single time. It's so much fun. Uh, And it, it really builds the tension. Yeah, and it makes Dawkins look like a monster. Uh, and he, I mean, he was a bulldozer in that match. That, like, 360 stinger splash thing that he does in the corner mm-hmm. is, like, really cool looking. Yeah, and then those spears that he was uh, hitting oh, them both God. with. And then, so there was a spot, I think it was O'Reilly and Dawkins were in the ring, and O'Reilly just hit him with a knee, and it looked so brutal. Oh, my God, like, I know, and he fell back into the corner. Yes, yes, that knee. I was like, I think he's out. Like, legitimately, <laughs> I think he's out. I thought the same thing. Uh, it definitely looked like it knocked him silly, and that's a credit to both guys because it's one thing to execute the move, but it's another to sell. And I think uh, big props go out to Angelo Dawkins for selling that move like it rocked him. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, like, I, that was one of the most noteworthy moments of the match for me was that knee. I just, I can't get the visual out of my head because it's like, I don't know, every Sunday morning there's like a, a viral UFC clip where a guy just, uh, it's like a three second bout and the guy just takes a knee to the face and he's out, you know? Like, I immediately was drawn to, like, that yeah. idea. Yeah. That's an entirely gifable moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else was there? There was so much in this match. Um, Montez Ford. Uh, I think I've said it on here before, but I know I've said it to you. I think, I think he's way more talented than he's aware of. Uh, at, what is he, 6'4"? I don't know, but he's tall, dude. He's really tall and really lanky, and like the air that he gets just on his drop kicks. But then when he goes to the top rope, he could have grabbed onto the cage that made itself available later. <laughs> like <laughs> that's what it feels like. Yeah, and he's not even really lanky. He's like he's cut. lean. He's very very yes. lean. Yes, yes. I'm uh, just I meant lanky in that his arms and legs are very long. Yeah, but he like like you said he uses that to his advantage. Uh, between his drop kicks, which always look beautiful. I remember he hit Kyle O'Reilly, I believe, with a huge drop kick at one point. And every time I like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I like throw my arms up because they just it just looks so good. And then he he did a uh, I mean, he 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 normally does the frog splash, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he was he went through the ceiling on the frog splash, but he also uh, set up for and almost hit a people's elbow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which I was like, oh my God, really? And then he he hit a rock bottom when he came into the ring, but they, they called it a, a urinagi. Yeah, just a urinagi. <laughs> but it was clearly the rock bottom. <laughs> like Samoa Joe does a urinagi, and they called what Montez Ford did a urinagi, and they are not the same thing. No. Ford threw his arm over his shoulder and went all the way to the ground with him. Yeah, uh, this was Street Profits' match to shine. They looked incredible. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish looked amazing, as always. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly, type 1 diabetic, shout out my man. Uh, Every time I'm like, is he dropping low? Is his blood sugar dropping low? Is he okay? When he makes that stupid face when he's, like, dazed. Yeah. You're, you're like, wait a minute, is he dying? Every time. He's so good. <laughs> His facial expressions are so good. And I know That's there great. was, like, a Twitter account that was gifing different Kyle O'Reilly, like, expressions. Faces? Yeah. That's uh, funny. It's, it's amazing. If that's not he, a Twitter account already, it should be. Just Kyle yeah. O'Reilly's faces. <laughs> he, um, he was really impressive in the match where he was just taking all of the wild bumps like uh the the only, the comparison that went into my head while I was watching it was like the only guy that used to take bumps like this and not be appreciated for it is Christian. Yes. Uh that's that's what I thought immediately, but I was really impressed with with Bobby Fish in this match. He was calculating, um methodical and it's almost as if he he could he's teetering on for me a really good singles run in my opinion you think i think he's very capable of a really good singles run hmm. uh, i'm not against a singles run for bobby fish um so that would be an interesting dynamic to see bobby fish go after say the north american championship or even the nxt heavyweight championship yeah okay i like it i love all the dudes in undisputed era they're probably the best group of the last five years, I'd say. I mean, they're the best group in NXT history, and that's easy. Yeah. Um, but as far as... I, it'll be interesting when and if they go to the main roster. I'm not begging for it, because I don't want them to get lost. No. And that's, uh, but it'll that's be very interesting. A lot of people say, like, Vince would ruin them, so... Uh, I mean, it's at least 50-50, right, for everybody? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I love Street Profits in the win here. Uh, I thought it was an awesome match. Yeah, it was a fantastic match. Uh, and like we said several times over, great way to start the show. 
and Street Profits wearing the throwback Toronto Raptors colors. Oh, was that it? I didn't even notice that. Yeah, the the purple and red is cool. what Toronto's uh, uniforms used to look like. I do really dig the purple. Yeah, it's a it's a nice purple. So moving on, we have Io Shirai versus Candice LeRae. This match, I I was I wasn't necessarily too hyped for. Uh, it's had a a decently long build, but it's been another one of those like because it's NXT, you don't see people for certain weeks and that kind of thing. Um, it's still awesome that Candice got a singles match on a on a and on a take on a takeover. I thought that was awesome, and yeah. I love heel Io Shirai. I was out on her. You could go back and listen to the archives. I was not a huge fan. I didn't really know what she offered, and they had her with Kairi Sane, and it was kind of muddy because I was like, oh, just because they're Japanese together? That's weird. Um, but right before EO turned heel, I really in- started enjoying her work, and then the heel turn and how she's played it since, love it. I'm in love with how she's doing it. Yeah, it's like everything clicked once she turned heel. Um, her attitude, the the attire that she has was great. I loved the black yeah. and yellow. Um, yeah. Her entrance music, friggin' awesome. Oh, so good. Because like it like sets a tone and a mood yeah. immediately, which is what entrance music is supposed to do. But some of the theme songs on NXT don't fit the performer, in my opinion. But right. EO's heel music perfect and they also when she came out like for her for her entrance itself she still almost does the same motion that she did when she was face Mm -hmm. but obviously she's not carrying the mask anymore and she doesn't do the eo symbol with her fingers and her the facial expressions that she was making there was like anger and resentment and aggravation like all in what she was doing with her face and then she just starts yelling Yeah, and you get all of that from the entrance, which sets perfectly up for the match. Because if you're getting all of that information right in the first 30 seconds of you seeing her, you're like, okay, this is believable. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you you weren't following NXT week to week and you didn't know who she was, you knew all that you needed to know within the first 30 seconds. Which is a credit to her as a performer. Yeah, and no, I agree definitely. That's a great point. And Candice LeRae, like you said, getting a takeover match is huge. And especially like a singles female takeover match that doesn't have a title or anything behind it. Yeah, that's that's uh, a progress is what that's called. Just because there's not a title involved doesn't mean that they don't deserve to have their feud blow off at a at a event or however you want to word that no definitely and uh like for example alexa bliss never competed on a takeover before so it just right. goes and to show came, like yeah the opportunities that female competitors are getting now versus even three years ago so what are your what were your overall thoughts on the match itself honestly uh this match for me was close to match of the night, in my opinion. Uh, these two girls proved why they deserve to be on this show. Um, between the the false finishes, um, the way they were just like laying into each other with the strikes. Um, I liked how Candice LeRae started the match off hot by just jumping EO, and they just brawled for the first couple of minutes. But there was specifically one spot where uh, EO Shirai put... Candice LeRae up on the top rope and like shoved her off to the outside and Candice like bumped really hard on the apron and then EO came in with a 619 and I was like that's cool yes that Um, was a good spot I I like how Candice LeRae hit the mustache ride which is a tribute to her time with uh, Joey Ryan on the Indies as a team Mm -hmm. so uh, seeing her hit that that swinging neck breaker off the top rope I thought that was a really cool spot I thought that was going to be it. So when EO kicked out of that, I was like, what the hell are they going to do? Yeah. Um, <laughs> EO, EO is nothing short of just relentless and, and brutal. Yeah. And 
EO went up for the moonsault and connected and Candace kicked out of that. So I was like, they're just pulling out all the stops. Yeah. Like they, they had a fight and I'm fully satisfied with the result that we got. Uh, I think EO Shirai winning was the, was a really good decision and uh, great showing by both females. Definitely agree. Yeah, I really liked the uh, the finishing sequence of utilizing the 619 again, but to the back of Candace's head. I thought that was especially brutal How uh, to continue off of how Io was working on her the entire match. Mm-hmm. Yeah, coming out of that match, we got the triple threat for the North American Championship, which was the champ Velveteen Dream defending against Roderick Strong and Pete Dunne. Dude, this match was great for so many reasons but uh before we get into the actual match let's talk about velveteen dreams entrance as the mountie because <laughs> i popped real hard for it yeah i was like what is hap oh he's the mountie i got it like only he could pull that off and not be laughed at um and it was so like neat to have that nostalgic moment for a second yeah and then Roderick Strong's jacket oh my god it immediately caught my eye because the the lo- the undisputed era logo on the back with all their initials looks so clean on that jacket yeah a lot of guys have like really interesting pay-per-view gear Roderick Strong his entrance jacket uh two thumbs up here from Roy Lee Rumble here <laughs> And Pete Dunne with the green accents and his his sweet biker vest uh, with the spikes. I li- yeah. like it. like it a lot. I did I did enjoy the green accents on him because normally he's wearing like burgundy. Yeah. But the match. Let's talk about Dude. the match. Oh, my God. They – I knew that – I knew – I had a feeling that it was going to be uh, toss Dream aside and let uh, Roderick and Pete go at it. But every time the three of them came together, it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically that spot where uh, I think Roderick and Dream are punching each other. And then Pete just like shrugs and just starts punching wildly into the group of them too. Yep. they. Uh, he's just full on like was just like, you know what, whatever, I'm in. And starts yeah. brawling. <laughs> like just great stuff all around. And I, I really, really enjoyed the fact that this wasn't a traditional triple threat match where they didn't do a ton of like false finishes. Yes. That was one of my biggest takeaways from it was that it wasn't, we didn't kill everybody's finish in the match. Like it actually played out to the point where they were exhausted and then somebody hit a finish and it was over. Yeah. They didn't kill each other's finishes. Uh, They utilized their signature moves, which I thought was great. And if someone did hit their finisher, it was the third man coming in to break up the pin versus Mm -hmm. a a kick out. Yeah, I loved um, specifically Roddy going to the well again and again for the backbreaker. I mean, obviously he's the messiah of the backbreaker, but I... He hit so many different innovative ones and then used the same one multiple times in a row, and I I love that. Um, Done also, obviously, with the uh, joint manipulation. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, oh, man, there was a spot that he did. Shit. Was it when they were on the top rope and Pete Dunne pulled them down? Yes. Oh, my God. I was like, what are they going to do? They were just setting up for it and setting up for it and setting up for it. And then Dunn just like killed it. <laughs> and it I like awesome. I like how Dream sold his back that whole match. Yes. Uh, so like yes. when Roddy was hitting the backbreakers, it registered. And so Dream went that whole match selling the back, tried to pick both of them up for the Dream Valley driver, which I was like, yep. no way. <laughs> yeah, and luckily, yeah. he his back gave out, so. Yeah, they, <laughs> it was, that was, that spot was nuts, because I was like, how is he going to roll the two of them? Um, but right before that, somebody hit a, a, a double move. Roderick Strong had both of them in the stronghold. That was such a great spot. That was so cool. Um, 
and then uh, dream through a Dream Valley driver in there on one of them just out of, like out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And then just kept rolling, and I was like, man, this is this match is – it had everything. It had absolutely everything. No, for sure. Um, I loved, like you said, the joint manipulation by Pete Dunne, hitting the bitter end, and then, like, getting dropped with an elbow. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that was a nice touch. He also, I think, went for the X-Plex, and then I think either Ro- – I don't remember who he did it to, but it was probably Roddy that landed on his feet instead of, like, taking the, the actual bump from Yes, him. yes. That was great. And, I mean, dream by pin, and then he kind of stole it, you know? Mm-hmm. But I, I thought that was perfect. Yeah, just when it looked like Pete Dunne was about to capture the title, Dream came in with that elbow drop off the top, which always looks great. He always oh, and he he could clear the entire ring. Yeah. He also he also did a uh, a, a coast to coast elbow drop. Yeah. When they were in the corner. Yeah, he had him in the tree of woe. And I said, <laughs> I was like, if he wanted to jump from the top turnbuckle out of the opposite side of the ring, he probably could clear it. Insane, dude. Uh, and that's that's where his height comes into play. Yeah. Because I was like, hey, how did he? And he got himself into position perfectly. And the elbow drop landed nice. That spot was probably one of my favorites of the match. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a little disappointed we didn't get Roderick Strong winning the title, but I'm I'm okay with Dream retaining. Yeah, I would like to see. I would like to see if he's gonna lose it, lose it in a one on one situation. Fair. I don't want him to lose it, but if he does, I just want Roderick Strong to get more than what he's been dealt. Because right. I think no, he's, absolutely. I think he's so absolutely. much better than just stuck in the the North American title picture, but never winning it. I agree. He deserves uh, a a big shot at some point. Mm-hmm. Speaking of somebody who may or may not have deserved a big shot, <laughs> uh, how did how did you feel about the Shayna Baszler Mia Yim match for the NXT Women's Championship? Um, I was, I was very optimistic about this match on paper and then it, it happened and I was the whole time I was like disinterested and, uh, it just felt that like they were really sloppy and rushed and there was no reason to be. Yeah. I, um, it definitely was not my favorite Shayna Baszler match. Um, although after the fact, thinking about it in retrospect, there were a lot of parts of it that were good yeah, and that I liked, but having to have watched it and sat through the whole thing, it really wasn't, it wasn't great, unfortunately, but I loved the idea that, uh, Gim worked Baszler's arm yes. and shoulder to the point where she couldn't use it yes. at all, um, and the, the visual, and I think honestly, she should just start doing the clutch with her legs, because that looked so brutal. It did. Uh, I'm glad like that she could. She was gonna just pop her head like a walnut, like just crack it. Yeah. I'm glad that they did use uh, Shayna's arm throughout the whole match, and then she sold it so well, and it played directly into the finish. Which yeah. to me is smart. Um, Definitely, and I wish this kind of thing would happen on WWE TV more often. Yes, I wish they would go back to this style of work a work a a uh, appendage that is important to the competitor to give yourself an advantage. Because obviously, the internal logic is Mia Yim is saying, if I take her arm out, she can't choke me out. Which is how she was beaten the last two times. Yep. So she's studying her opponent and learning. Right. How did you like the the build to this with the face of the story taking out the other girls behind their like uh, sucker punches and whatnot? I thought it was cool only because how often and how long has Shayna Baszler been doing shit like that? You know, like, right. finally, like, her tricks caught up to her, and the tables were turned, and I think 
that put Baszler in a situation that she's never been in before. At least we've never seen her in. So she seemed very taken back. She seemed very uncomfortable because she, I think, realized like, oh, she's not she's not screwing around here. Right. She's going to bend the rules just as much as I bend the rules, if not more. I liked, yeah, I liked the idea that Mia Yim was like, uh, not today, you know? Yeah. Like a, like a good guy pushed to the brink of having to do quote unquote bad things to make sure that stuff happens for them. And I, I saw some people complaining about like, why is she attacking people from behind if she's your face? And I'm just like, you're clearly not paying attention to the story then. Because it made sense. Yeah. Because Duke and Shafir were like the thorns in her side. So she's trying to level the playing field. Yeah. So that's why she's like, oh, I'm taking them off the board. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that they weren't involved in the match. Because it, at the end of the day, it lends credibility to Shayna. Yeah. She and I mean. her without the help and in in a, in a certain sense lends credibility to Mia Yim that she had a straight up match with Baszler and she lost but she held her cuz that match was long yeah it was very long and it felt like that's part of the reason why it seemed sloppy because they were rushing but they had so much time to play with yeah i feel like if maybe they took out one to two spots early on uh they could have really taken their time with the rest of the match and it still would have worked oh i agree definitely definitely she's coming up on a year on her second title reign so i think keeping the belt on her was a really good idea um it's yeah i don't i don't think mia yim's necessarily ready yet you know yeah but it was cool to see Shayna against a like a new opponent and have a, a story like that made sense going into it yeah with a completely she kind, different she, style her, her bookings kind of been like all over the place recently she's just destroying everybody so it was cool that she had like a threat and she knocked down the threat and now we'll see what happens mm-hmm. i still think uh they will do a slow build to candace LeRae being the one to take Shayna baszler's title off of her definitely 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 think that that's where it's going she's a great baby face so it's perfect mm-hmm. and i feel like we haven't had that big of a baby face since Oscar potentially in NXT to have that yeah. big title moment win, and even even yeah. before Oscar Bailey, mm hmm mm hmm, that was probably the biggest one before that. But even still, even when Kyrie Sane won it, I don't even think it felt like that big of a baby face win. No, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I guess let's discuss the final match of the evening. The two out of three falls match, which was essentially a three stages of hell match between yeah. NXT champion Adam Cole and the challenger Johnny Gargano. They did so much in between the bell and the first fall that by the time we got to the cage being lowered for the third fall, I was like, oh, this is torture. <laughs> like, they, they went, like, 60 minutes. They, yeah, they did. They went, like, an hour, basically. Um, and I, I loved uh, I loved the idea of the first fall, like, Johnny giving it to Adam Cole. And I can't wait to see if the fallout of that match in, includes, but isn't limited to, Johnny being criticized for costing himself the title essentially because mm-hmm. I think he'll be able to play like maybe that's something that sticks in his head and and bothers him about what he did in that match and he like second guesses it and stuff he plays all that really well so it'd be interesting to see if it works itself into a promo or something of that nature yeah absolutely I think it will because Gargano is always really good like you said with the psychology aspect of the wrestling. And uh, I think I think it's going to come back to to haunt him, literally. Uh, but I am glad that this program's over between the two. I felt like they were kind of overusing the two out of three falls thing until it happened. 
once the match started, I was like, okay, this makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. the entire build, I was like, oh, they're doing two out of three falls again. Yeah. Really? And I think I think that's why they did it was because they wanted to show you, yeah, we could do six matches, uh, uh, essentially six matches in two matches. Mm-hmm. And just be like, and it's going to be better than your shit. So, <laughs> The one thing that I didn't really care for, and, and you kind of touched on this briefly, was there was so much packed in that first fall. So much that by the time the second fall happened, they were still killing each other. So, like, the, the bumps and the, like, the moves that they were hitting, and then by the time the cage match started... It's like, how are these guys still going? Um, yeah. So that's, that's that's why it felt sort of like a detriment to me because it yeah. felt like too much. It's almost like they were going finisher for finisher, finisher for finisher. Yeah. Like Johnny did a, a lawn dart into a chair and in any other situation, that's a pinfall victory. Yeah. Um, Cole hit two. <laughs> Two Panama Sunrises in a row. And one was off a ladder. And Johnny kicked out of... And one of them was off of a ladder. And Johnny kicked out of both of them. And then Johnny hit one off the top turnbuckle. And Cole kicked out of it. And that's where... Like the... The cynical part of my head is like... they're, They're super kicking each other in the face. Yeah. Like somebody has to lay down for a little while but they just go back and forth kicking each other in the head and like that's the new quote unquote new style of pro wrestling take that for however it's worth to you um but that's why i can't handle the criticism from some people who enjoy this and then turn around on SummerSlam and get mad that goldberg no sold two uh, super kicks from Ziggler mm-hmm. because you, you got the same thing the night before and you loved it. So don't even. Yeah. And, and I noticed it like immediately I was feeling it. I was feeling a little bit of the fatigue, but I mean, the match was so goddamn entertaining that it, it almost exactly. felt like exactly. it didn't matter. Yep. And I don't know if it that's happens. a good or a bad thing. It happens every time, and I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing either, but it happens every time. The match overall is just so damn entertaining, and Johnny going for the, the sledgehammer and then finally getting it, and then um, th- he spent a lot of time with the wire cutters getting the barbed wire off the top of the cage and then didn't really even get to use it. Yeah. You know? that That f- was just like... I felt like that was a wasted opportunity and there was some time in that going for that that we could have been doing something else. Oh, absolutely. I did like the fact that the cage had barbed wire on it, even though like it didn't get any play. No, I, I loved the idea of it because it kept them in, but more importantly, kept Undisputed Era out. Mm-hmm. And I liked and that it wasn't an escape like it wasn't exactly it was just pin you're you're not leaving here until one of you gets pinned or submitted that's it but here's a bunch of implements to kick the living hell out of each other and did you did you hear about the controversy with triple h and the one i don't know who it was yeah uh the guy asked him like well the implication of barbed wire you guys said that you were beyond blood and guts and triple h was like uh there was no blood as far as i was able to tell yeah and he's like but the implied violence and it's like (laughs) yeah you're reaching yeah it's literally the entire show is implied violence (laughs) (laughs) whether it was eo shirai and candice LeRae or johnny and and adam yeah that's all the whole show is implied violence they literally spend their entire careers learning how to sell (laughs) the implied violence yep absolutely (laughs) this is a dumb a dumb question from a guy who's probably like drowning himself in AEW Kool-Aid. Absolutely. That's exactly what that was. <laughs> Cuz they're trying to find a chink in the armor that is WWE to yeah. open them up to criticism, criticism and from Triple that. H uh, I think apologized afterward for like torching him really bad. Probably, but that's because Triple <laughs> H is like a stand-up dude. 
Yeah. He's like, I had to shut that shit down, but also, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... So which one of these which one of these finishes was your favorite? Did you like Cole tapping out? Did you like Johnny going with the with the chair? I, or did you like the incredible fall from the top? I liked uh Cole tapping out, to be completely honest. That second match was fantastic. Um not to say the first or the third weren't, but it all made sense that Cole would tap out at that point. Yep, and he's done it. He's tapped out every time. Yeah, <laughs> so it's it's perfect. What about you? Um, honestly, I go between the first, the first and the third fall. Huh. Um, I loved the psychology of Johnny going. I'm gonna get two in a row. I'll give you this one because I want to weaken you for the second fall mm-hmm. with the chair. I love I love the psychology of that. Um, and the kick to the balls was great that Johnny took all that. Um, so that first, that first match and that first fall were, were fantastic, but there's something about two guys on top of a cage falling through a table that will get me every time. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I adored (laughs) the fact that they went through that table. Um, it just felt. The, the fact that they were both thrown yeah they didn't they didn't they one of them wasn't taking or giving a maneuver yeah. to the other one yeah they just jumped together like that time seth rollins and dean ambrose in hell in a cell did the foley spot and then got taken out on stretchers together yes like it was like that they just decided to dive together at the same time. So that's why, um, to me, it wasn't my favorite. But it still looked cool, and they kind of overshot did. that first table completely. They definitely overshot Cole, that first Cole table. ate that on his shoulder in the worst yeah. way. <laughs> and his lower back. Yeah. He got a nasty road rash on <laughs> his lower back from the table breaking. Yeah. Um, but I loved, I loved that... They fell off, and it kind of looked like Johnny was the one that forced them to go off of it. Mm-hmm. But then he took the brunt of the fall and the and and the pin. It was the Shane McMahon Miz thing. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. I loved that. Fi- I loved the idea of that finish. The concept of that finish mm-hmm. was that Cole didn't necessarily beat him, but he was smart enough to roll over. Yeah. And could we just talk about like when that uh, cage started to come down, and Adam Cole's face was yeah. like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah, his terrified face is uh, next to next to the gods in how he sells that. When he's scared or annoyed, like he just the, oh, <laughs> face that he makes is great. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was also, I just wanted to, to, to touch on this really quick. Because you know how a lot of wrestlers are like uh, pigeonholed into like a type like the high flyer or a brawler or whatever. Adam Cole doesn't have a class. He is a, an all around just fantastic pro wrestler. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. He's not a high flyer. He's not a submission guy. He just is really goddamn good. And he can just do it all. You want to mat yeah, wrestle, it. he'll mat wrestle with you. You want to take it to the air, he'll take it to the air. You want to uh, brawl out with weapons, he can do it, you know? He's great on yeah. the mic. He's got a great look. Um, he's got a great catchphrase. Yeah. Great merch. Uh, he's just, he's a great performer, and I think he's more than earned the NXT Championship and to carry that brand. Definitely. I'm really excited to see who they move up into a program with him now. I'm thinking maybe Keith Lee. I honestly, I hope so. Because it'll be awesome to watch Keith Lee tear through Undisputed Era when he has to. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Yeah. I would say Matt Riddle, but he's in the middle of something with Killian Dane. Yeah, that just happened in the middle of the show. Which I love. How great was that? I love that. He just It looked like he just shoot took a mic and was like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. 
And I thought that was so cool. And then Dane was like ready with taped fists, but that, whatever. Yeah, that I pointed out. I was like, oh, geez. Uh, yeah. I was like, was he expecting it? Was he going to jump Riddle first yeah. or whatever? Uh, they Their interaction was brutal. Mm-hmm. And Dane doing that, that crossbody on the stage. Oh. Oh my God! It looked like he died. Yeah, it looked like it looked like Riddle died. <laughs> and then taking out all the security guys with their moves. Yeah, only to the be thrown one, and through he just, the tables by the stage. It was awesome. Yeah, and then he he just grabbed the one and was like, "You're coming with me." <laughs> <laughs> that was so cool. Uh, I love that spot, and it's definitely something that they should do more often, where guys are just brawling. Mm-hmm. Um, and like it's because they don't have a match on the show because they only ever do five matches. And they still were given time on the card, which is cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm excited to see where NXT goes from here. Yeah, it was basically, it was one of the first takeovers that there were like no title changes Mm -hmm. and everything was kind of status quo, which is interesting. But it put an end to the feuds of Johnny Gargano, Mia Yim, and uh, Undisputed Era and Street Profits. So we're going to have all new challengers going forward. Yep, definitely. So yeah, anything else regarding NXT Takeover Toronto? No, I just it, it was super entertaining. Uh, I watched the tag match twice because I was just like, I have to see what they did again because it was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought overall it was a great show. I thought it was slightly outshined by SummerSlam that actually delivered on almost every level on Sunday. Um, but yeah, it was, I loved, I love NXT. So it was, it was, it was great and indicative of their brand for sure. Absolutely. Um, so what would be your match of the night? Um, I, I, at the, at the risk of, of just not wanting to do the main event because it was the main event and obviously people are just gonna be like, Oh, that was the match of the night. Uh, I'll say the tag match. I was going to say the tag match as well. Yeah. It was that much fun. Not to take away from anything else on the card. No, absolutely not. But it was just, it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. So that was episode 30, NXT TakeOver Toronto review. Um, If you like our reviews, let us know. Uh, You could drop us a comment or tweet at us, at Royally Rumbled, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Yeah, definitely uh, interact with us. We love being interactive on the twitter yeah you can look out for more stuff from us coming very very soon because we have things up our sleeves yeah we're it's we're wearing short sleeves and we still got things up our sleeves because it's hot out it's very hot you can find me on twitter and instagram at jl 24 fps and i am on twitter and instagram at yesball And if you want, you could drop our other podcast a follow at Pop Cannon. That's Cannon with a K. For potassium. Yeah, we talk uh, movies, television, (laughs) comic books, video games, all that fun stuff that's not pro wrestling. So if you like any and all of those things, go ahead and give us a follow. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Pop Cannon. So that's it. That's uh, episode 30. What are you waiting here for? What are you still doing here? Go home. It's over. That's it. Turn it off. <laughs> you Ferris bueller it. <laughs> the show is over. <laughs> Cue up your next podcast. Yeah, one of our old episodes that you haven't listened to is about to start. <laughs> so for Royally Rumbled, I'm Jordan. I am Robert. And remember, no no guess guess is is as good as as ours. ours.